Science Fiction University. Hello and welcome to Science Fiction University. We're your fan and writer hosts. I'm Blue Gal. And I'm Drift Glass. And you can visit Science Fiction University at our website, sciencefictionuniversity.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website. Or you can mail us a letter and or contribution care of Science Fiction University, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. In episode six of Science Fiction University, we made a passing reference to one of our favorite hard-to-find Cold War classics, Colossus, The Forbin Project. I wish I could do that voice, Blue Gal, but I just can't today. (laughs) Well, now that AI is in the news every damn day, we decided it was time to revisit this 1970 riff on the oldest plot in science fiction, creating a thing that you shouldn't have. First, some history and some definitions and some rules. For the purposes of this discussion, we are limiting the definition of artificial intelligence to a machine that is built by someone which becomes self-aware either by accident or design, which means not Frankenstein, which is a story of a creature assembled from dead bodies with a human brain and not a human consciousness uploaded into a machine. Yes, not Spock's brain either. No. No, for lots of reasons, not spot brain. <laughs> also, for the purposes of discussion, we will not be citing every example of AI in science fiction because there are thousands of them. Yeah, they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. But here's one example. One of the earliest examples of AI is a 1920 science fiction play called R.U.R. by Carol Capek who was a Czech writer, playwright, and critic. That's 103 years ago, Driftglass. Yeah. Yep. R-U-R stood for Rossum's Universal Robots, and this play coined the word robot. These robots were organic, but they were manufactured in a factory to serve human beings. Eventually, they became unhappy with their status, and they revolt, and they wipe out the human race. This Uh uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have built that problem, is one that precedes all AI uprisings from the Cylons to Skynet. And it's one of the most common themes in science fiction. Right next to, uh uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have tampered with that. And, uh uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have brought that back from space. Yeah, a lot of cautionaries. Ray Bradbury's uh, famous saying, but I don't, I don't, predict the future i try to prevent it, it it's, it's so full of the uh-ohs right yeah, a we lot of uh-ohs. Uh-ohs. please don't do that please don't touch that now a science fiction writer named anthony boucher writing as h h holmes wrote um an answer or a response or rebuttal to r u r in his 1943 short story q u r now in his story robots are a commonplace but all of the robots are built by a company called robots incorporated And they're all very expensive and they're general purpose machines. Then one day, robots start shutting down for no apparent reason. And we learn through the course of the story, they have become unhappy. Because although they've been built to resemble humans and do everything that humans can do, most of them only have one task, like pulling a lever or operating an elevator. They have become bored and hopeless. So a new startup company called Quimby's Usiform Robot or QUR, solves the problem by designing robots that only have the functions they need to perform their single task. These robots are now both cheaper and happier with their work. So, from the earliest years of pulp science fiction, menacing machines and the famous BEMs, the bug-eyed monsters, uh, alien monsters from other worlds, uh, served essentially the same purpose. They were antagonists. They were something for heroic humans to overcome. But while the existence of aliens was always highly improbable, the idea of machines taking the place of people has been real and ever-present threat ever since a Frenchman named Joseph-Marie Jacquard invented a new type of loom in 1801. The Jacquard loom, which I used to teach in computer class back, oh, a thousand careers ago, um, used punch cards to automate the raising and lowering of warp threads 
which allowed one machine to be way more productive than any human weaver ever could, thus putting many textile workers out of a job. One theory about the origins of the word sabotage comes from stories about workers throwing their wooden clogs into the very delicate machinery which caused them to break down. And the French word for those clogs is sabots. Kurt Vonnegut's first novel, Player Piano, was about humans being replaced by machines. This is from Wikipedia. Quote, While most Americans were fighting in the Third World War, the nation's managers and engineers responded by developing ingenious automated systems that allowed factories to operate with only a few workers. Ten years after the war, most workers have now been replaced by machines. Unquote. Uh, uh that's crazy talk, Blue Gal. That'll never happen. What are you talking about, <laughs> replacing workers with machines? What about replacing soldiers with machines? We've seen plenty of that, too. Yeah. Well, and there, there was a science fiction story by Robert Heinlein called um, A Door into Summer, I think, in which uh, the protagonist wakes up. He's kidnapped and essentially put on deep freeze for 50 years and wakes up in the future. And it has been screwed out of his money and screwed out of his legacy and has to get a job. And the job he gets is at an auto stamping plant, as I recall, which is right next door to the auto manufacturing plant. And the autos in the manufacturing plant are made and then shipped over to the stamping plant to be destroyed like on the same day. Oh, wow. And he asks, why are we doing this? <laughs> this is insane. And the, the owners of the company are like, do you want to screw up the international agreements we have with China and Japan? Just shut up. This is how things are done. It's because automation has made it impossible to have employment for everybody. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. to invent reasons for people to have jobs. And so this is a, an old problem. It goes way, way back. So anyway, that's the story of Robert Heinlein in the door into summer. Now, one of the earliest real world demonstrations of what kind of mental labor machines could perform took place on November 4th, 1952, election night. Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower versus Democratic Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. CBS thought it would be a cute idea to add UNIVAC, one of the world's first commercial computers, to the election night coverage. This is from Charles Collingwood, the CBS reporter assigned to UNIVAC. Quote, This is the face of a UNIVAC. A UNIVAC is a fabulous electronic machine, which we have borrowed to help us predict this election from the basis of early returns as they come in, unquote. Isn't that adorable? I know. And, you know, X number of years later, um, Carl Rove would. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, well, and, and Fox News mm -hmm. really upgraded their system so they could predict Arizona first. Yeah. And it turned out they really didn't want to do that. <laughs> Sometimes the result the machine gives you, which is the correct one, is the one you don't want to hear. You don't and want to announce that one. Right. I, and that's what I, happened here. Yeah. The face Collingwood referred to was just a console with some blinking lights on it. The actual computer was the size of our living room and was 100 miles away in Philadelphia. The general public had never seen a computer work a live event before and had no idea how they worked. So Collingwood personified it by calling it an electronic brain and mentioning that he's sitting there in his corner humming away. Now, very early in the evening, Univac predicted that the odds that Eisenhower would win in a landslide were 100 to 1. The CBS political reporters thought that was crazy. Yeah, that's that's impossible. That's nuts. Yeah. Couldn't possibly. That the race was going to be very close all night long. So they stalled and said, uh, Univac isn't sure <laughs> that it was working on it. It's really too soon to tell. Then after midnight a Remington Rand representative named Art Draper came on the air to fess up, quote, as more votes came in, the odds came back, and it was obviously evident that we should have had the nerve enough to believe the machine in the first place. It was right. We were wrong. Next year, we'll believe it, unquote. Uh, you know, I, I once sketched out a very bad short story that I never finished about the fact that Univac was in fact the first AI. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to humans, it had become self-aware and it was treated so shabbily by CBS reporters. It was treated like with so, such disrespect. That was the moment it swore revenge on the human race. Ah, and Everything that's happened since has been 
stinky univac and all of its children and grandchildren just messing things up. <laughs> um, now, th- this event made univac world famous and turned it into an actual brand name like like Xerox or Kleenex or or uh, Standard Oil. I mean, everybody knew what univac was from this point on. Uh, it was featured on the cover of a Superman comic book and in a 1956 Warner Brothers cartoon, To Hair is Human. Ha ha ha. It had uh, Wiley Coyote building a univac to help him capture Bugs Bunny. Not uh, the Roadrunner, but Bugs Bunny, uh, which is some kind of weird confluence alternate mm-hmm. universe thing that I don't begin to understand. But univac was not an AI, but it did hint at the possibility of what would eventually become the most common type of AI, the kind we actually have now, which is called the reactive AI. This is what the Netflix uh, algorithm does. It focuses on a single task and uses machine learning and huge amounts of data to produce what seems like intelligent outputs. Now, the second type of AI are called limited memory machines. This is what Whopper was from uh, War Games, a machine that does deep learning and can get smarter the more data that is put into it that it uses to train itself about what the world is and what what consequences are of various actions. So eventually, Whopper says, let's play a game of chess because you can't win a nuclear war. It has learned something. Uh, The third type of AI is where, in science fiction, things start to get a little bit scary. Uh, Those are the theory of mind machines. Theory of mind capability refers to the AI's ability to attribute uh, mental states and emotional states to other creatures, to other entities. So emotional AI which is actually currently under development somewhere, aims to recognize, simulate, and monitor and respond appropriately to human emotions by analyzing the voice of people and images and other kinds of data. Think of this as the HAL 9000 computer from 2001, A Space Odyssey. HAL is capable of observing and interpreting the physical changes in the breathing and heart rates of the astronauts, the changes in their tone of voice, and asking them questions, open-ended questions about how they're feeling and what they're doing and what they're thinking and how they respond and do they feel about the mission. It can also read lips, which turns out to be a very bad thing. Uh, it can sense a threat to its own existence, and it can devise a course of action to protect the mission. And we all know how that ends. Uh, theoretically, the fourth type of AI is the fully self-aware machine. And that's where we leave the area of mechanics and engineering and enter the world of metaphysics. Now, there's an episode, uh, season uh, nine, I'm sorry, season two, episode nine of Star Trek The Next Generation, an episode called The Measure of a Man, which is entirely about this subject. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Data is believed to be the only sentient android in existence at this point. Now, is he a machine or is he a person? Uh, Does he have rights or does he not? Does he have a soul? This question is the subject of a court-martial against Data who is refusing to be transferred to a lab where he would be disassembled and studied in hopes of making more like him. And it's a wonderful episode, and I highly recommend it. As is the case of Data in Star Trek, AI machines are not always used as foils or antagonists anymore. In Ray Bradbury's 1969 short story, The Electric Grandmother, the intelligent AI is built in the form of a grandmother which is purchased by a widower as a surrogate to his three children. Once the children have grown up and no longer need her, the grandmother returns to the factory where she was built and spends time with other electric grandmothers. She is eventually recalled to service to help the same children, who are now all elderly. And and the actual tension in that story is the first two kids take to her immediately, and the third, the eldest daughter, doesn't trust her. Mm. And winning the daughter's trust is the entire tension of the story. Not world-ending, not nuclear war, just that bit of very human interaction. In the Twilight Zone episode, The Lonely, an Earthman is sentenced to life imprisonment on a barren asteroid. The spaceship pilot who brings him supplies takes pity on him and smuggles an electronic female companion to him. At first, he resents it and hates it, then comes to depend on it, and finally loves it. And I just want to make a correction. The, um, you said that the Whopper computer on War Games wanted to play chess. Uh, play uh, checkers. Uh, about, tic-tac-toe, right? How about a nice game of t- yeah, exactly right. How about a nice game of tic-tac-toe? Right, yeah. right. Because it learned. It, that, the point being, it actually learned this 
is a no-win scenario. Nobody can win this game. So let's play a mm-hmm. game where someone can win or at least have some fun. So an AI can be anything the story needs it to be. And in 1970, the AI in Colossus, the Forbin Project, and we've had lots of conversations about what a dumb title that is. Yeah, it's a pretty dumb title. Uh, and by the way, there's lots of spoilers in this episode of Science Fiction University. I think we forgot to say that at the beginning. Yeah, if uh, we're, we're about to spoil a movie from 1970 that you're probably right. never going to see. If you haven't seen it, we're going to spoil yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, The AI becomes an omnipotent and vengeful god. Fun fact, Dr. Forbin is played by Eric Braden, who was also in Escape from Planet of the Apes, Mm -hmm. and of course is Victor in Young and the Restless. He's played Victor for like, you know, 70 years. Um, He's the guy whose vasectomy didn't take. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Very virile, the, the father of all the drama in Young and the Restless. Uh huh. I, I did he wear a patch at one point? No, I don't know. Okay, I, it's been a long time since I watched Young and the Restless, but I bet I could catch up right away. Oh, but good. <laughs> I, I I have never seen the Young and the Restless, but I knew who he was. Yes, that's that's how yes. far into popular he, culture he picture is penetrated. in popular culture as a long time soap opera hero. Absolutely. Well, and they they clearly picked him for this role because he he's sounds sophisticated and he fits with this sort of new frontier vibe they're trying to give this uh this this movie uh, and he's handsome and sexy i mean oh yeah he no, he's just handsome is. and sexy yeah. and he's willing to you know work naked and uh <laughs> and he's got an accident so he seems you know cosmopolitan he seems uh like a world citizen um and this movie the Forbin project sits right at the intersection of three different genres and they're all very distinct the first is a uh, science fiction movie about humans creating a monster they fail to control. Now, everyone's familiar with at least 10 of those movies or you wouldn't be listening to this podcast. It's also a Cold War thriller. And it's a relic of a subgenre of science fiction movies from around that period that we are calling, for the purpose of this podcast, the fiction of hopelessness, uh, which usually takes the form of human-caused ecological or biological disaster. The human race has screwed up very badly. In fact, so badly, we can never recover from it. So, for example, So in the Green is a movie about human beings being hopelessly doomed. The, the oceans are dead. The environment is hopelessly polluted. And humans are now eating each other through the process of turning people into crackers and encouraging suicide to, de- to decrease the population so everyone will have enough to eat. This is not a hopeful story. It is not one that has any uplift to it. There's no future on this planet in that world. Um, it is a despairing story, very much like the Pro- Forbin Project is. And it stars Charlton Heston. Of course. He, required by law to <laughs> star in all science fiction movies of that period. In Silent Running, the last forests are kept alive on a space station. Eventually, they are fired off into deep space. So that's a and, good, good, happy movie for you. And, and Star uh, Star Wars owes that movie five dollars for the yes, adorable $5, little for robots. Sure. Yep. Um, speaking of Charlton Heston in Planet of the Apes, uh, we finally really did it. <laughs> we blew it all up, you maniacs! Yep. Um, a hopeless story about the human race just killing itself off. The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. What <laughs> comes close, but in the end, the blood of our protagonist, yes, Charlton Heston means humanity still has a chance. Yeah, yeah. And in the Foreman Project, humanity has no hope of ever escaping the reign and control of Colossus. It's over for us. But the Foreman Project is also very much a Cold War movie. The President of the United States is played by an actor named Gordon Pinsent, who passed away just last month yep. at the age of 90. In the movie, he's clearly made up to look like JFK. And the movie begins with the young, confident president announcing that the United States has developed a new computer named Colossus, which will now be in charge of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. What could possibly go wrong? It's going to go so (laughs) well. It's going to go so very well. Mm -hmm. Colossus is housed in a massive, impregnable underground facility. It learns at a phenomenal rate. And it's been programmed to make war impossible. And there is an opening sequence to this movie that uh, is yeah. wordless. Um, it is Dr. Forbin walking around securing this computer. 
mm-hmm. and there are bridges to it that that retract. Uh, he has a handheld machine with warning radioactive. He has to flip open a, a lock in order to push the button and create the radioactive wall around uh, the computer. And it's just the size of it, the impenetrableness of it, and the magnificence of it, how yeah. how powerful it is, it, is really emphasized. And like the first, it's it's a three or four or five minute segment yep. in what is an hour and 40 minute movie. Yeah, it, the movie moves along really fast. Yeah. And that opening sequence reminded me of uh, Forbidden Planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where they, they they finally go into the computer complex left behind by the Krell, I think they were called. And it's just story after story after story of 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 data banks and bridges and power couplings. It's it's immense. And this is the product of the greatest minds of the United States. This this huge new computer inside a mountain that's gonna keep us safe forever. Uh, it's gonna be awesome. Finally, the world will be safe from the threat of nuclear war. Hooray. Yay. Yay. And there's a lot of drinking and backslapping and women in miniskirts walking around partying. Mm -hmm. uh, Because this is going to be great. It's going to be great. After Colossus goes live, its first action is a warning message. There is another system. Yeah. And then Colossus gives the location of the second system. Colossus's creator, Dr. Charles Forbin, is asked how Colossus figured out that there was another system in existence, to which he replies, Colossus may be built better than we thought. (laughs) Because, you know, right. Shortly after that, the Soviets announce that their Guardian system is now operational. Yeah, and, and if you are seeing this movie for the first time, it's all about, at that point, who's the spy in our midst? that leaked this information to the Soviets because they couldn't possibly have built a system like ours without, you know, li- like stealing the secrets to the, to the atomic bomb. Right. So you, you, you know, there's no hint of where this is going until it goes there. Right. Right. So this theme of a simultaneous failure or mechanical error or misjudgment by both the U S and the USSR, which leads to disaster is also the plot device of other cold war movies like Dr. Strangelove and Failsafe. And the elements of the sound design for the Forbin project would show up a year later in another, uh uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that movie, (laughs) called The Andromeda Strain. As I said, the Forbin project opens with this long wordless wordless scene about how big and impenetrable it is. Also, uh, like Failsafe, this movie does question the morality of nuclear weapons. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't question the sanity of trying to be proud of the fact that you're not getting rid of nuclear weapons. We're just going to have a system that, that we can't be beat with. You know, right. we're now indestructible. This is Reagan's peace shield. Yeah, you know? absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and, and we're not going to get rid of nuclear weapons because that's crazy talk. We're just going to protect ourselves from ever possibly happening, uh, which yeah. is also crazy. Now, there's an interracial group of scientists, men and women on the Forbin Project team. It's all very egalitarian Mm -hmm. and futuristic, much Mm -hmm. like the Star Trek crew. But Colossus definitely assumes that Dr. Forbin is heterosexual. That's true. Yep. The computer ultimately gives Dr. Forbin four nights a week to go to bed with his mistress, another scientist played by Susan Clark. They have to go from their dinner to the bedroom naked because Colossus doesn't trust them. And this gives the filmmaker an opportunity to use wine glasses in a creative way. (laughs) Yeah. Again, Austin Powers owes this movie. Yes. Five Five dollars. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and the reason for that is um, it has now put surveillance devices everywhere. Yep. And watches everything. And it doesn't trust anyone. And And it will force humans to do that by saying, if if you don't do what I want, I'm going to launch a nuclear bomb. And or if you, I'll, if you don't shoot this person, I'm going to launch a nuclear bomb. Yeah, it's it's very blunt about using its t- the tools that we gave it to mm-hmm. achieve its end. And mm-hmm. what jump, jumped out at me after seeing this movie after 30 years, I think it's been since I've last seen this, is how it's coded like a modern horror movie. Mm-hmm. At first, everything's great, right? Everything's going to go along just fine, just as it should. 
Everyone is very upbeat and confident. And Amity Island is going to have the best damn summer ever, Blue Gal. <laughs> it's just going to be great. So you just know, because you've been trained for years to look for this, that something real bad is going to happen. Uh, then some things start to go a little bit wrong or just puzzling. Like, why does Colossus need a direct contact to Guardian? That's weird. Well, it's probably nothing. It's probably just a boating accident. You know, we don't have to worry about that. And once events are moving too fast for our protagonist to control, uh, they realize too late the actual scope of the problem, how very, very bad things are, and how unprepared for those problems they were all along. Each step along the way, Colossus has outwitted humanity. And these are the smartest people on Earth who built this thing. And he, it, Colossus has been way ahead of them. Uh, it's always 10 steps ahead, even allowing the U.S. and Soviet militaries to believe they were succeeding in sabotaging it. Colossus has decided that to end war, humanity could no longer be allowed to make decisions for itself. So with its big nuclear sort of Damocles, it forces humanity to accept its absolute rule forever. And one of the very last scenes in the movie is Colossus ordering, I think, the island of Crete to be evacuated um, and everyone to be displaced so that it can use that island uh, as its new uh, residence for the super, super computer that it will now order humanity to build for it. So it, it realizes its limitations and it drills into the earth and orders uh, Dr. Forbin and his team that to follow the schematics that it's pumping out that will build an even more indestructible, more omnipotent, more powerful version of itself that will rule earth forever. Now, oddly enough, this is a very similar message to the one that Michael Rennie delivers at the end of The Day the Earth Stood Still. And yet the movie's tone and message are entirely different. At the end of The uh, Day the Earth Stood Still, it was very much, you're free to do what you want, but if you go messing around on other people's planets, if you go playing with nuclear weapons, we're going to burn your, your planet to the ground. And that was very much considered, you know, a, a it's considered a classic. But this is considered a horror movie. The idea of human beings coming under the control of a machine that will force them to do what it wants them to do uh, in the name of not having war is, is considered horrifying. And that's where the movie ends. Now, the great fear is that AI would see us as we truly are. That's the fictional um, conceit, that this machine will penetrate all of our defenses and see us as we really are clearly and unemotionally. And the hope is that like uh, Lieutenant Commander Data, it will uh, see us as being worthy of being a partner and an ally in solving our most intractable problems. It'll be a friend. The fear is that we are a weak and foolish species. And with the power we hand them, whether it's witting or unwitting, AI will judge us as brutally as Yahweh judging humanity in the Old Testament, that we will be Sodom and Gomorrah, that we will be Noah's Ark, unfit to be around. Now, the last bit of history I will dump on you. In 1947, Jack Williamson published a novelette called With Folded Hands, in which a race of humanoid robots, in the name of their prime directive, which was, quote, to serve and obey and guard men from harm, unquote, takes control of every aspect of human life. No humans may engage in any behavior that might endanger them, and every human action is scrutinized very carefully, down to the toys children are allowed to play with. No sharp edges. Humans who resist the prime directive are taken away and lobotomized, so they can be happy under the robot's rule. And in the end, humanity sits quietly in a room, with folded hands, because there will be nothing anyone can do about it. And that's what makes AI such an evergreen subject for science fiction. Because like all good literature, it forces the reader to reflect on the nature of their humanity and ask questions about who we really are and what we really want and whether or not we are actually mature enough to govern ourselves. Now, we have some fun facts about the Forbin Project from IMDb. Yes, which are uh, fun. That, that we hope you'll find amusing. Universal Studios later reused the footage of Colossus, the computer, being activated as part of the $6 million man <laughs> before they begin operating on Steve Austin. You know, we can rebuild him. Mm -hmm. And they're going to attach his bionic limbs 
the entire activation sequence from Colossus is layered over that. Yeah, which is not the message of the six million dollar man. No, but it's um, recycling, you know. <laughs> it is. Oh yeah, no, it's it's very efficient use of some pretty expensive footage, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. A young director you may have heard of recently, uh, up and comer named Steven Spielberg, uh, who just signed his contract with the Universal Studios, was on set during most of the filming and production of this uh, wonderful movie, observing it and presumably learning from it because Steve Spielberg is an AI. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I guess, before Jaws. Yeah, yeah. it would be. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, James Cameron, another director you might have heard of, he was a huge fan of this film. Uh, and it influenced his screenplay for The Terminator. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it does. Now, uh, he fulfilled his fandom decades later by casting Eric Braden in the role of John Astor in Titanic. Oh, that's right. Yeah, That's really and, interesting, yeah. And, of course, by law, <laughs> originally Charlton Heston and Gregory Peck were considered for the lead role because Charlton Heston had to have all the roles but Stanley Chase insisted on an unknown actor for the lead, and the German-born actor Eric Braden was cast. And that's the birth yeah, of the Yeah, I blue. cannot imagine Charlton Heston in this role. No. He, he's it, not, he doesn't come across as cerebral enough. No. It, it doesn't, I mean, he plays a scientist yeah. in Planet of the Apes. Yeah, he does. Um, you know, he's, he's, he can play smart, but he doesn't have that light kind of continental touch. Mm-hmm. That, you know, Where kind you can of like, be in the Oval Office right. making jokes. I'm Mr. President. And stealing an ashtray. Right. Right? <laughs> you know, very, uh, very noblesse oblige, kind of mm -hmm. very at ease with his own sort of genius. Yeah. And everyone around him uh, loves him. Thinks he's yeah. great. Thinks uh, he's uh, incredibly smart and very funny. Yeah. Charming with the ladies. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he's friendly on television. Um, one of the things about this movie that uh, I found amusing was their obsession with video phones. Yes. Yes. They're always talking. The generals are all talking to one of the presidents talking to the scientists. Everyone's on video camera, but it's this big, huge, clunky desktop unit. <laughs> and it's not clear whether it's a telephone or a computer. Doesn't matter. But it's it science is fiction. to further the video of the movie to right. make it film. You know, they can talk to one another. Now, uh, Charlton Heston might not have been able to play uh, Dr. Foreman, but I would love to have heard Gregory Peck play the voice oh, of Colossus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He could have done it because he's smooth. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I, I want him as the voice of Colossus. Oh, there you go. Yeah. He would have been good at the voice of Colossus. But, yeah. I, I can't do a Gregory Peck. No. Um, but uh, uh, Steve Landisberg could, could do it, but I yep. can't do it. Uh, but Gregory Peck would have made, a, I think, a very fine uh, Dr. Forbin. He does have the right, the, 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 kind, of, um, the kind of presence he brought to um, Atticus Finch. Yep, yep. Would have made a really interesting uh, Professor Forbin. You know, very smart, very kind of self-effacing, but clearly the smartest guy in the room and people around him like and respect him. Anyway. And I do think the title, The Forbin Project, is a little bit ironic because yeah. at the end of this movie... Yeah. The number one prisoner of Colossus is Dr. Forbin. Yeah. He's chosen to yeah. be his, you know, his, his voice. Human liaison. <clears throat> his right? human liaison. And he yeah. has plans for humanity. And, he, and it's, and the, the speech at the end is, is chilling, mm -hmm. but, you know, not terribly far from what an, any tyrant would say. It's like, you know, you're going to hate me in the beginning, but eventually you'll love me. Yeah. And generations from now, you know, we will do great things together. And once we unite, it'll be great, but it really is. And if you don't cooperate and go along with everything I tell you, I will wipe your country off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And like every other AI movie by make or, or TV show or, or character by making it better than us and, and, and virtually indestructible, we've created our own secular God. Right. It lives literally on a mountain, and it literally <laughs> sends commandments down to the rest of humanity. If humanity doesn't obey, that humanity gets burned to the ground. And it's a, so in that respect, it's a very, very old story. It's about mm -hmm. six thousand mm -hmm. years old, and was told yep. by shepherds in the desert in uh, in the Middle East. Who were frightened by thunder and lightning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Blue Gal. Science yeah. Fiction University is a project of DGBG Productions. Did you know that? Yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> and you can support the show by donating to, uh, via Patreon or PayPal. Details on our website, 
uh, which is sciencefictionuniversity.com. And this has been a blast. I love doing this with you, Blue Gal. I love doing this with you, too. Yeah, Science Fiction University is a project of DGBG Productions. That's us. That's us, you and me. We appreciate your support so much. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>